Father, thank you so much for your mission. Lord, you didn't, uh, you didn't choose to live life alone. You are the great creator, the prince of life, the author of creation. And you decided that it would be in your great pleasure to create other beings in your image that you would share love and laughter and joy and healing and life, just life itself. You would share life with us. I'm amazed, God. I'm grateful and I'm excited. And to hear you say, Lord, that this is just a shadow, that our life here is just a glimpse. Uh, we don't have the mind to fathom what you have prepared for those who love you in the heavenly experience. I'm, I'm just flabbergasted, God. I, I just am a, uh, truly bewildered at your immense love for us, your desire to give us purpose, to give us a mission, to bring us joy, and, and to experience the uh, gr greatness of the diversity between love and hate, lost and found, light and darkness, joy and sadness, victory and defeat. God, it's as though you allowed us the defeat, the darkness, the lostness, the difficulty, so that we could greater appreciate the victory, the love, the joy, the freedom, that through our anguish and through the pain that we experience, you bring forth a better understanding of life and, and the goodness that you are. It's as if had we not seen the reflection of sin, we would have never known the greatness of righteousness. And so God, I, I just, man, your plan is just unfathomable. It's just beyond me. And uh, wow what life you bring us. And we get a taste of it here on Lord, right here on this earth, God, and I, I just am grateful that you keep giving us sparkles of life through the move and the power of your Holy Spirit by the authority that comes in the name of Jesus. And I pray, God, that we can get a better glimpse, a greater maturity, that we could get our eyes off of the world and the distractions, and we could get our eyes onto you Lord, that we could stop walking in the flesh so much and start walking in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, your Spirit, with the mind of Christ and not this earthly mind that always seems to bring us down into the pits, but with the mind of Christ that you've given us to those who are born again. You said that we would have a new mind, a new spirit, a new life, a new way, a new perspective, a new future, a new purpose a new understanding, a new authority, a new ability. Help us to operate in that. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I am so excited about Acts chapter 3. And uh, we've gotten here on a mission, many of you with me. And we're pursuing that same thing. Can you imagine if I tried to preach that first sermon, Elijah's Plow, and include everything that was kind of in my mind, we would still be here today, listening to that one sermon. But um, we've been kind of, in a way, preaching the same topic, the same journey all along. And it's okay if you haven't been here for the beginning of the journey or you missed an episode because they're all pointing us uh, in the same direction. And so uh, uh, part of it, as a recap, has been to highlight the boldness of Jesus. And we have seen how bold he was. We, we looked at specific stories that weren't to do with maybe the way he heals people or the way he interacts with people. I mean, the world is very familiar with his love. But we began to look at verses in which Jesus was audacious. He was uh, uh, unassuming. He, he assumed the moment and he was bold and he did things that, that might even cause a little stir in us, like how, by what authority, how, what gave him grounds to do that. And, and, and he was just uh, so 
unapologetically bold. They said of him, he spoke as one who had authority. He didn't teach like the scholars or the scribes. That when he spoke, he spoke. And people were like, whoa, this is different. It doesn't come from necessarily his education. It doesn't come from his pedigree or his family or his foundation. It comes from some sort of authority that's outside himself. And we even learned a little bit, if you keyed in last week, that that authority that he didn't speak on his own. He only spoke with his father, God, had given him to speak. And we ended with that when the Holy Spirit would come, even the Holy Spirit would not glorify itself, but the Holy Spirit would glorify him. It would not speak of its own. It would speak of Christ. We saw how Jesus overturned the tables and, and uh, you know, the priests and the scribes and the people of the tradition are thinking, what is this guy from Galilee, Nazareth, doing, throwing these money changers open? And he's turning them over and he's flipping tables. And, and we ask the question, you know, maybe there's some tables in our traditions. Maybe there's some tables in our society. There may be some tables in our life that need a little overturning today. And we learned a lot about where authority comes from. It doesn't come from us. Which is liberating because if I don't have to qualify, you know, if I don't have to be smart enough, strong enough, rich enough, in the right place, of the right family, of the anything, if I don't have to reach for some kind of earthly position and that I get my authority from God himself, it's liberating. Because now, all of a sudden, we have license to do things that we would never have license to do. And then we talked a little bit in one sermon about Jesus not being intimidated. And, and he had dilemmas in which he was trying to please multiple parties. Please them, in other words, the zealots and the Herodians. We talked about the tax collectors and the sinners. And, and how he, with his words, sometimes would say things that I for lack of better English, always call magical. He, he would spell out something and it would appeal to different sides and they would be drawn to him. And they'd be like, yeah, he's the one. And yet, with a separation of the people that he was attracting, if you put them together, they didn't magically gel with one another. It's like church today. We come united under the name of Christ. From different backgrounds, different experiences, different races, all kinds of differences. And there would be nothing, nothing to bring us into this room together, all of us into this room together, if it weren't for Jesus. And I find that marvelous. And so, you know, as in this journey, it's kind of easy to come to the idea that, uh, well, that was Jesus. Of course he was bold. Of course he overturned tables. Of course he wasn't intimidated. Of course he could do the things he, he, he did because that was Jesus. But what about me? Can I be like that? Can I live like that? Unapologetically bold. Can I be under the same type of authority? And so that's where we're entering. We're entering into the book of Acts. And spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Yes. You can be like that. Tommy brought the verse that I am hoping to get to. And, and uh, that is truly in Acts uh, chapter 3 and verse 13. But I want to start, start in Acts 3 chapter 1 and just work there. And we'll go as far as the Lord will let us go. First, I want to read a verse, and you don't have to turn there, but it's Matthew chapter 10, 24 through 28. And it's Jesus in the midst of his ministry. And he's talking about the effects of his words and how it causes people to accuse him of having demons. Jesus' words always divided. His, his words were never lukewarm. They landed hard on your heart, and they either changed you or they drove you away. That's just the way it was with Jesus. He was just a black or white kind of guy, as we would say it in today's vernacular. When he spoke, it had an effect on you. It either made you mad, 
or it made you happy. It made you get set free or it bound up your heart and revealed the dark stone coldness that was already there. It's just surface stuff. And so in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, Jesus says, students are not above their teacher or if you will, disciples. Disciples are not above their teacher and slaves are not above their master. Disciples are to be like their teacher and slaves are to be like their master. I bring this verse because it's a call. It, it, it tells us that if you're a disciple of Jesus, you are to be like him. And you should become more and more like him and less and less like you. Now, there are attributes that God put in you that are like Him. And you get to keep those. But there are other attributes in you that are not like Him. And if you plan to follow Him, you need to shed those. Paul, even in his great maturity and his old age, while in prison for Christ, says to the Philippians, I die daily so that Christ can live in me. He's still crucifying little pieces of his flesh, his character, his personality that needs to get out of the way so that God can live clearly and in him and through him. And Jesus makes this call, and since Jesus is the master of the household, has been called the prince of demons, the members of his household will be called even worse. Jesus is letting his followers know that if they did this to me, and you are following me, they will do it to you. Because the world hates Christ. No, you know, the world loves aspects of Christ. It loves the love of Christ. It loves the grace of Christ. It loves the mercy of Christ. It might even say it loves John 3.16. But you know, this is a very big Bible. Mm -hmm. And it contains a lot more than John 3.16. And I love John 3.16. So don't mismark my words as, as, as trying to tear anything out of the book. Actually, what I'm trying to do is put everything back in the book. And so part of the character of God is, is righteous, it's virtuous, it's pure, it's holy, it's indignant, it's determined, it has purpose, it's life-giving. And those things are not always attractive to our world. Because our world loves greed, it loves pride, it loves self-attainment, it loves autonomy, if you will. It wants to be independent. And I don't have any code thing going on here, so I'm just talking about us. Amen. And so he's trying to prepare his disciples. He said much. He said in verse 25 of, or 26, I think it is, of this Matthew, don't be afraid of those who threaten you. For the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed and all that is secret will be named known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad, abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus is trying to prepare his followers to equip them with the same level of boldness, the same purpose, the same distribution of determination. And he's letting them know what they're going to do to me, they're going to do to you. You know, a person who has no relationship with Christ and hasn't come to really love him might go, well, what they did to Christ, I don't want to be done to me. Therefore, I don't want to follow him to that level. And I will say simply that you have not been truly born again if you're not ready to participate in the sufferings of Christ. Baptism itself is a symbol of the death, your death, and his. The burial, your burial, and his. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and yours.
And so when we go into the waters of baptism, it's much more than just getting wet at a, at a tub. It's a place at which God forgives sins and, and, and He covers us with the blood of Jesus. And He says, in this new life, in this new person, He will be born again and He will have the same Spirit in Him. It's been prophesied since the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, actually even in Deuteronomy, it's hinted to through Moses, that God was determined that he would write his covenant laws in your heart. He would take that, that stony heart and make it flesh and put his spirit in it. That's what happens at baptism. And so as we mature in him and we nurture that Holy Spirit in us, we want to be like Jesus. Paul at one point says, I rejoice that I participate in the sufferings of Christ. It's very hard for us, our flesh, not our spirit. It's very easy for our flesh to go, man, I don't want to suffer. But on the flip side, our spirit says, I rejoice that I participate in the sufferings of Christ. Now, let me delineate. Sometimes we suffer for things that weren't anything to do with Christ. And both our flesh and our spirit cringe. Because we're paying the penalty of our own choices. Choices made in the flesh, not in the spirit. Hopefully that's not too complicated. Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Now I want to put time and place for you that, that Jesus has died. He rose from the dead. In the period where he died and before he rose from the dead, you know, Peter and John were in anguish. There was confusion in that little moment of time it, it, when Jesus had died. I mean, Peter had rushed to defend Jesus. He, he had lopped off the ear of the servant of the high priest. He, he, he thought he was going to fight for Jesus and for the cause. And then Jesus is crucified and there was confusion. And then the women come and they say, the tomb is empty and Peter and John run to the tomb as quick as they can. They investigate and they find it's true that the body's been removed. And it's not long before Jesus is appearing to his disciples and he's telling them, I'm alive, feel the wounds, touch my wrist, touch my side, let's eat together, I'm alive, I'm alive. And it's revolutionary. And there's a little bit of confusion. I mean, he's been teaching for three years, but it's not like it all soaked in. It's not like they got one lesson and now they're ready for the next one. They, sometimes the scriptures even tell us they will reflect back to the things he did and said. I remember the scripture says that in regards to the flipping of the tables. And, and, and it says, I think it was Matthew that says it, we remembered... In the scriptures that it said the zeal of my father's house will consume me and they applied these scriptures retroactively they began to see that Jesus had done things that in the moment they didn't really realize was going on okay and that's kind of how it works with Christ a lot of times so here's Peter and John these bosom buddies in my opinion you see them paired a lot in the scripture I think they really loved each other they were brothers in Christ they ran to the tomb together it was a race John got there first but John didn't enter Peter barged in okay these guys loved each other and they're going to the hour of prayer the resurrections happen Peter's heart has been repaired there's a great story in the last chapter of John in which Christ interacts with Peter and, and says, you know, I, basically, I know you denied me, but Peter, do you love me? And, and he helps Peter to realize that, yes, you do love me. Because a lot of times the actions we, we commit sing a different song. And in Peter's case, he denied the Lord three times and ran in the end, because of his confusion, Peter denied Jesus in the moments, I would imagine, were the hardest moments of Jesus' life. And so it would be very easy after you've been the betrayer, after you've denied Jesus, after you've failed, after you've sinned, when you know you think you know that you should have been better than you are and you don't perform the way that you thought you should and so you fall to the ground and then you get to see the Lord again, all you're filled with at that moment is shame. 
because you betrayed the one you love the most. But you can't even tell him you love him because you think everything you did screams the opposite. It screams I'm a coward and I did not demonstrate my true love for you. And so Jesus comes and, and heals his wounded soul. Because, you know, the devil is the one, he's the accuser, night and day, accusing God, uh, accusing you before God of, of your sins. He's the one who brings him to account and says, look, your, your son, your born-again son, your born-again daughter did this. Your son, your born-again daughter did this. And they did this. And this screams against you. And this screams against you. And this screams against you. And night and day, the accuser, the, the Satan, the, the, the serpent, the devil, he is there to destroy, to kill, and to tear your life, to divide you. His one purpose is to get you stripped away from the Holy Spirit. To kill that spirit in you. And there's the blood of Jesus. That's what it's for. That's why you shed it. Because you can't do it. You can't. As much as you love God and as much as you do everything you can to please Him, you just can't do it. But His love is so great. He did it for you. He paid your price of death. He said, you know what? Your sin separates you from your God. But I never sinned. I will take your penalty for you. Amen. And that's the gospel. And here are Peter and John going up to the hour to the temple to pray. It's the resurrection. They're, 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 they're the rejuvenated Peter and John. These are the ones who kind of have their mission now and they're getting it straight. And they go up to pray. And, and there's a lot of things that flood my mind. I'm like, why are they going up to pray? Didn't they just abandon that whole Judaism thing and start the new Christian thing? No, no, it just didn't go like that. It was a gradual process, this thing we call Christianity, to become the way it's morphed into the way it looks like today and the way it looked then. They got up to go to the hour of prayer because that's what they'd done all their life. And just because Jesus was the messianic Messiah of the Jews didn't mean that they all of a sudden abandoned everything they understood that Judaism taught them to do. But does that mean we need to have a rule that we pray three times a day on five days of the week and we go up to the hour of prayer? And, and so all that stuff hadn't been worked out yet. But they're still praying and they're together and they go up to the to the temple to pray and there's a certain man there who had been lame from his mother's womb but was being carried along whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple later in chapter 4 verse 22 we're going to learn that he was 40 years old Okay, he's 40 years old and this scripture tells us that from his mother's womb He's been lame. Well, I'll tell you one thing that means. That means this guy has never walked. Yeah. Never walked. It's not like he lost his ability to walk. He never walked. And so in the miracle that we're about to read, he, he begins to walk. There's not just the miracle of the restoration of his physical body, but there's the restoration of an understanding he never had. There's the understanding of balance that he never had. You don't have to think about balance until you get a little older again, <laughs> when you're young and then when you're old. But in the middle, you don't have to think about balance. You can walk without ever thinking about it. This miracle was so perfect that it instilled with him the capability to walk. I mean, if it had just been physical, he still wouldn't have known how to walk. But he gets up. He doesn't just walk. He leaps and he dances. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. That's what he'd done all his life. And Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze upon him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. It's what he's done all his life. 
okay, this guy's demanding that I look at him. He's ashamed. He looks down. He's never been really into the inner courts of the temple because you're not allowed to go into the inner courts of the temple if you're lame. He's never even been in there. He may have gotten as far as the, the court of the Gentiles. I don't know. But he didn't get anywhere where his fathers or his, his grandfathers were privileged to go. He'd never been able to get that close to the presence of God. He'd always had an interruption. There'd always been something lame in him that inhibited him, something he couldn't change, something he had nothing to do with, something that he was born with that just stopped him from getting to the presence of God. And so, you know, these guys, they, they, he's, a, he's, a, he, he's shameful. I mean, the, in the other parts of the Bible, that, that in that period of culture, they ask questions. Even the disciples asked of Jesus one time when it came to a blind guy, who sinned? Was it this guy or his parents? So, so in the moment of that culture and that time, they looked at people that had ailments or, or diseases or, or brokenness or calamity in their life as people that were being punished, either by their sins or by their fathers or mothers or, or their family sins. And so as a result, they were, they were looked at as lesser and, and, and hopefully we don't do that. We don't want to do that at all. But they did in that culture. And so he had a natural look down kind of thing. I, I, you ever meet people that, that that's all they do is they look down. They walk down. And, I mean, and they generally, without you even thinking through the process, you, you generally assess that that person does not have a very high self-esteem. Okay. Well, that was this guy. And, and so Peter says, look at us. Lift your head a little bit. Look at us. And verse 6, Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but I do have something to give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Wow. One thing is he's, he's not expecting it. At the best, he's expecting a really good gift of super silver coppers. Uh, some good money. He's not expecting Peter to walk up and say, in the name of the guy who died and is rumored to have resurrected recently, get up and walk. It's just, I don't believe it even crossed his mind. From the text, we see that he expected to receive something. I don't think the something was that the chains in his life that he'd had all his life would suddenly be broken. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. I believe that Peter literally kind of has to seize him by his hand and pull him up to bring him to realize what just happened to him. I don't think he even understood it. And this is just me and my thinking. But I don't think he even understood the power that had just gone into him. I don't think he understood the healing that had just occurred. And so he needed that brotherly helping hand. He needed somebody to reach out to him and grab his hand and lift him up. And I think it's kind of like that little video we saw. At that moment, he, he pats his legs. He's having feeling and then he's overwhelmed. And the Bible says his, his feet and his ankles were strengthened, which is interesting. The Bible, this portion of the Bible is written by Luke, and so a lot of commentators mention the fact that, that uh, Luke um, is a doctor, and so he takes time to use doctor terms in Greek. So there are different terms for different things, just like in English. So in Greek, he uses like the medical terms, and he says, basically, this guy started to heal from the bottom up. From the feet to the ankles. Uh, okay. And so I thought that was pretty neat. And, and with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. The first time in his life. Yeah. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were 
taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them, to him. They'd wondered what happened to him. I mean, this guy, for all we know, has been sitting there off and on for 40 years. And sometimes we suffer for a week and we're like, Lord, how long do I have to suffer? He gets up. He's walking and leaping. People can't believe their eyes. That's the thing about many of the miracles that God performs is they're undeniable. When God does something, it's undeniable. Nobody could say this is not the guy. It's his twin. Back in the factory, they cloned him and they brought out a guy who wears the same clothes and acts the same way and talks the same way and looks the same way and everything's the same way, but this one doesn't have the lameness that the old one does. That's what you'd have to produce. That's the level of lie you'd have to produce to deny the miracle that had just occurred. And while he's clinging to Peter and John, it's no wonder, wouldn't you, if, if you'd just been set free from the bonds that had bound you all your life, that you stopped a long time ago dreaming that you could even change or be healed. Long time ago, I wonder, maybe at 15, maybe at 18, he had stopped even thinking about being healed. He had stopped even thinking about walking. He had accepted his weakness, his brokenness, his low level of society. He had accepted it, and his face was downcast, and he would stare at the ground because that was his life, and he absorbed it into himself, and that is who I am. And yet it's not all of a sudden, and so he's clinging to Peter and John. Makes sense to me. All the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. Whew, I would be in the crowd running to see this too. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you gaze at us? As if by our own power or piety we have made him walk. Oh, this is amazing. When Jesus healed people, they looked at him. They knew he was the healer. And he never rebuked them. You know, there are people in this world today that have formed into religious groups who think that Jesus was not God in the flesh. He was just something else. But one of the greatest testimonies of his piety, of his godliness, is the fact that he never deflected praise to himself. If you praised him, he took it right in. He never deferred the fact that, yeah, I did that healing for you. But at this instance, Peter and John are saying, we did not heal you. Don't look at us as if it was by our power that this happened because we are powerless. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, the one you delivered up to Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disown the Holy One, the Righteous One, and ask for a murderer to be granted to you. And you put to death the Prince of Life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact, a fact to which we witness. Peter is quick to let him know, you know what, this guy was not healed today by my power or my piety. He wasn't healed by my holiness. He wasn't healed by my godliness. It's the same uh, word in Greek that's used in 1 Peter 1, 7 that, should, that has a list of things you should add to your faith. And one of the things you should add to your faith is godliness. This is that same word. And Peter is saying, it's not because of my godliness. It's not because of my piety that I have, uh, uh, have within me that this guy can walk today. It's only, it's not by my power, it's only by the name of Jesus, this servant. He calls him, in the, in the 
in the dialogue that Peter has here, what he's doing is he's using all the messianic titles that Jews were familiar with that would point to the Messiah. In other words, they had the Old Testament. That's all they had. The New Testament wasn't written yet. And that was the book they studied. And they were expecting a Messiah. They crucified the one that, you know, that they were expecting. They didn't accept Jesus. They, they rejected the one who came. But there are all these prophecies in Isaiah and Psalms and Deuteronomy. And honestly, almost every book of the Old Testament has prophecies about the Messiah. And the Messiah has names in these prophecies. One of the great names that we hear a lot in Isaiah is the servant. Another name in verse 14 he uses, you, you crucified, you disowned the Holy One. In the Psalms, often the Messianic Scriptures describe the Messiah that's coming as the Holy One. And, and the Righteous One. And he caps it off with giving him the title, the Prince of Life. And this word prince of life, it could be in translation, it could be the captain of life, it could be the source of life, it could be the origin of life, it could be the author of life. We've been studying about this author of life every Sunday morning in our Bible study with Richard. And if you don't come, come, because it's so worth it. Always be prepared to give an answer for the reason, that, for the hope that you have. You're supposed to be able to defend your faith. And if you don't already have that understanding of how to defend your faith against atheists, against evolutionists, against the science of this world, then come on Sunday mornings and, and learn a little bit. It's worth it. But, you know, here's Peter saying, yeah, you guys crucified the one you were waiting for. And they understood all the titles that Peter rambled off. They understood exactly what he was talking about. And he was pointing to a lot of verses when he said that. And in verse 16, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Uh, in the Greek, it, it, you know, every translation sounds a little different, but he says, and on, uh, upon faith in his name. Upon faith in his name, this man is healed. Whose faith? Was it the faith of the lame man? No. Apparently not. He got hit by the broadside of a truck and could walk again and didn't even know it was coming. He didn't wake up that day thinking he was going to get anything else than a few coins in his bucket. This guy was hit with healing and it had nothing to do with his faith. What I have, he looked up expectantly. I could say at least he had that. He had faith enough to believe he was going to get something from Peter and John. Looked up expectantly, and the first words out of Peter's mouth are, I'm broke. <laughs> How often do you do that to the beggars you cross in our society? Aren't, aren't, aren't many of you glad that we carry credit cards now and not cash because we don't have to give it to the beggar anymore? Mm. Yeah, it's weird. I, I think the be beggars on the street corner sh should hold up one of those QR codes. <laughs> QR me. Venmo, cash app. Might work for a little while. This guy, instant di disappointment. I ain't giving you any gold or silver. But what I got, I'm going to give to you. Rise up and walk. So did Peter have that to give to him? Well, in that moment, he surely did. Did Peter always have that at his disposal to give? Was it Peter's discretion? I get to heal this one today, but I'm going to ignore the seven others that are sitting on the steps down the road from him. What determined what person would get healed and what person wouldn't. We never read about Peter going into the, 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 to the uh, well, even Jesus, when he went into the pools of Bethsaida and he finds the one guy that's sitting at the pool waiting for the angels to stir the water and he heals that one, it's surrounded. The guy complains that I can't get in the pool because everybody cuts in front of me. I can't get my healing. I've come here all the time. It's been a long time. I haven't been healed, but I can't get my healing because I'm, I'm just not in the, the rank of importance. It's like a guy waiting for a kidney transplant. And he's 80. Versus a 28-year-old waiting for a kidney transplant. 
28 year old's going to get it. That's how that guy felt, and Jesus picks him out for whatever reason, and he heals him. And we leave the scene, and we don't think about the 30 other people that are there that were never healed. We got, we, we want this kind of thing that is really socialistic. And it's the idea that everybody gets the same treatment. We think that's fair. And we wrestle with that all our life. From the day you're born, you begin to wrestle with what's fair. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And faith which comes through him has given this man perfect health. He didn't have to go back and get a checkup. It was a perfect healing. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did. So he addresses the fact that you crucified the author of life. You crucified, but the power, you, you're wondering how this happened. It happened through the power of Jesus, the one you crucified. It happened through the power of this guy who's risen from the dead. It happened through the one we've been dealing with for three years now. It happened through Jesus. Jesus healed this guy. I didn't heal this guy. John didn't heal this guy. Jesus healed this guy. Remember what I said, that when you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives glory to who? Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was in Peter. If we were just going through the book of Acts, we would have learned that the Holy Spirit falls on the church and the Holy Spirit consumes its believers. And when a person is born again, they're born of the water and of the Spirit. And that Spirit descends. In Acts 2.38, it says, repent. He's talking to his crowd. It's Peter's first sermon. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. He's speaking in languages of all the diaspora. The Bible even spells out the languages he's preaching. He's preaching to Jews that have been scattered throughout the world. He's He's ripping it out and he had to explain to them that man, he's miraculously received the gift of tongues to speak in languages he has not learned. And he begins preaching to the crowd and, he, and their, their soul is pricked. And they're like, so what do we do? And he says, repent. First of all, repent. Come to a mindset where you change your mind and you decide you're not going to be that person. You're not going to live that way. You're not going to do that anymore. Repent! And be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, it's for your children, it's for all who are far off, it's for all who the Lord our God shall call, Acts 2.38 and 39. That spirit dwelled in Peter, and from that moment on, it dwelled in a lot of people, but I'm highlighting Peter and John for this. It empowered him was not his power. It gave him authority. It was not his that he earned. It gave him power and authority through the power of the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he navigated to those steps to pray with John at the hour of prayer when they're blowing the shofar and he sees a man and the Spirit stirs within him and he says to the man, look at me. And the guy expects some money. And Peter says, I don't have your money. What I have, I give unto you. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. That's amazing. That is amazing. This is going to be continued. And I, spoiler alert, you can read ahead. They're going to get arrested for doing this. 
they're going to get busted for doing this. And they're going to get tried in front of their peers, their forefathers and their leaders. And the leaders are going to be a little bewildered. They're going to go, wait, these guys are ordinary and unschooled dudes. They're immediately going to realize that Peter and John are like nobodies. They're ignorant. They're unstable. They're just, they're just the word in Hebrew, and it doesn't mean idiot, but the word in Hebrew is idiates. It means that it has to do with the, they're unschooled. They, they look to themselves for their understanding. They're idiates. And then they say, because they, 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 they're marveled. They're marveling at the bold, unapologetic drive of these guys. I mean, we just dealt with Jesus. Now we're dealing with Peter and John. We just dealt with Jesus, and he was frustrating. But look, now we're dealing with two guys, and they're just like him. Darn it. And then the next verse says, they simply recognized that these guys had been with Jesus. Yep. You know, when Moses was on the mountain and he came down, his face was glowing. The Bible says it was glowing so much the people were afraid of him. They actually asked Moses, put a veil over your face, dude. We can't handle it. You've spent so much time with God and it's affected you so much that you kind of got to put a veil between me and you. I'm talking about you. What's your time with Jesus? Are you coming out of your prayer closet with real time with God? You're going up for the hour of prayer. You're with God. The Holy Spirit's all over you. And you're ready to distribute His authority, His power, His healing, His revival to the lives around you, even the ones that have been suffering a long time. I'm going to pray and then you'll find out why I'm holding a candy bar. Father, thank you for this wonderful group today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the story. It's just so revitalizing. Lord, as we creep through Acts and we begin to see uh, a similar theme, uh, Help us to capture it. If we want a picture of what the early church uh, looked like, we find it in Acts. If we want to find a picture of what Christians should be doing, we find it in Acts. If we want to find the plan of salvation that the early church used, we'll find it in Acts. If, if we want to know uh, how the church answered or dealt with is issues in, in its existence, we'll find it in Acts, Lord. So I pray, God, that we will look to Acts for a little while and we will find some answers that will shape us and mold us and help us to be the Christians we're supposed to be. Father, that it'll release the, uh, the Holy Spirit in us and it'll break the chains. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, amen.